Okay, this week we're going to be doing experiment eight, which is involving reaction mechanisms, specifically SN1 and SN2 reaction mechanisms. And this is really what we call a physical organic experiment. And what I mean by that is an experiment where we are learning about reaction mechanisms, elucidating what's important in the reaction mechanisms. The physical or the physics of what's going on is actually what we're going to be studying in this simple experiment this week. We are going to be looking at SN1 and SN2 reactions, and we're going to be able to determine what factors favor SN1 reactions and what factors favor SN2 reactions. And so you should be able to uh, discover those by looking at how fast a reaction goes under certain conditions. So just a uh, brief review. SN1, of course, stands for substitution nucleophilic monomolecular, and SN2 stands for substitution nucleophilic bimolecular, and that all has to do with um, the rate of the reaction and the rate determining step, of course. So let's start off with uh, the SN2 reactions. And you'll recall that the rate of these reactions is proportional to the rate constant little k times the concentration of your electrophile times the concentration of your nucleophile. And so if we double the uh, amount of electrophile, we're going to double the rate, if we double the amount of nucleophile, we'll double the rate, if we double both, we will quadruple the rate, of course. And so it's dependent on both of these in the rate determining step, the concentration. So let's just look at a simple example where we have ethyl bromide, and we're going to react that with iodide as a nucleophile. So the bromide, of course, is our electrophile because the bromine's pulling electrons to itself, making this carbon partially positive. Iodide being a nucleophile because it has a negative charge. And so in an SN2 reaction, of course, the nucleophile attacks from the back and kicks out, if you will, the bromide as a leaving group. So bromide in this case functions as a leaving group. This all happens in what we call the rate determining step, or RDS, which is, of course, the slowest step in the reaction. And you get the product, iodoethane plus your bromide leaving group. Uh, being completely divorced, if you will, from the organic part that it was originally attached to. Okay. SN2 is a single step mechanism. Don't confuse two for meaning two steps. It's one step. The nucleophile comes in as the leaving group is leaving to give us the product. And technically this is a reversible reaction, but there are ways to force it either to the right or to the left losing, uh, using uh, Le Chatelier's principle. Another important point that's hard to see here, but you'll recall from lecture, is that because the nucleophile comes in from the back to kick out the leaving group, you have inversion of any stereochemistry at the carbon containing the leaving group. So if you're dealing with a uh, chiral center at this carbon, you'll actually have inversion of stereochemistry there as well. So that's another way in which one can determine whether or not an SN2 reaction has occurred. However, that's a little difficult uh, in the lab time that you have to use that. So we're going to determine the reaction using a reaction known as the Finkelstein Finkelstein reaction, which uh, takes advantage of, uh, of the process, let me write this up here, of Le Chatelier's principle. So if we start off with chloroethane or bromoethane, it doesn't matter, and we add that to sodium iodide in acetone. And acetone is just a, a simple ketone. I'll give you the structure of it here. That's acetone. It turns out that sodium iodide is soluble in acetone. This salt, which we normally don't think of as being soluble in organic solvents, is sol uh, soluble in this very simple ketone, this very simple um, organic solvent known as acetone. So we can get the sodium iodide into solution. We add the um, chloroethane. The iodide, of course, will function as a nucleophile just like it did down here. The chloride will be a good leaving group. We get our iodoethane product, plus you get sodium chloride, which is not soluble in acetone, and so it precipitates out. It forms a white precipitate, and you can actually visually see this 
in the reaction tube as the reaction progresses. And so what you're going to do is look for the appearance of the white precipitate. You're going to be timing this with a timer so that you'll know how long it takes for the sodium chloride to appear, and that's going to be proportional to your reaction rate. So if something forms sodium chloride very, very quickly, you know the reaction went very, very fast. If, however, you have to wait 10, 15, 20 minutes before you see a precipitate, you know that that reaction is going to be relatively slow. And if it goes much longer than that, you know the reaction didn't occur at all. So we're going to look for the appearance of sodium chloride being that it's not soluble in acetone. It falls out of solution through this Finkelstein reaction process. So that's how we're going to test for the SN2 reaction. Now the SN1 reaction Again, substitution of monomolecular. Let's take an example where we have t-butyl bromide. And we can take this and put it into ethanol, or just a simple alcohol. And we can heat this up. Of course, heat being the little triangle. And what we're going to get out of this is tert-butyl ethyl ether plus HBr. This is known as a solvolysis reaction. Because the solvent is the ethanol and it's also a, a reactant. So it reacts with the alkyl bromide in this case to give us an ether plus HBr. And we could monitor this reaction by looking for the appearance of HBr by testing the acidity, for example. However, that's a fairly slow process because, as we know, the SN1 reaction involves, in the slow step, the breaking of a carbon bromine bond in this case to give us the cation plus bromide. So this is what occurs in the rate determining step. And then in the second step, of course, the ethanol attacks the carbocation. To give us a protonated ether. And then the bromide leaving group will come in and remove the hydrogen from that positively charged oxygen, the electrons go into oxygen to give us the ether product plus HBr. And it turns out that we could monitor this reaction by following the reaction by looking at uh, how acidic the solution becomes. However, that's not a straightforward and uh, easy thing to do, and so we're going to use a little different process whereby We're going to use ethanol with silver nitrate dissolved in it. So silver nitrate will dissolve in, uh, in ethanol. And when the reaction occurs, you get silver bromide as a uh, product. And what happens, the silver bromide will precipitate from the reaction and you'll get a white precipitate just like you did with the Finkelstein reaction. So you're, this allows you then to monitor the reaction quite easily. So what happens in this particular case when the carbon bromine bond breaks and you get the cation plus bromide, the bromide immediately reacts with the silver because we've got silver nitrate in there, right? So we've got these ions that are present and silver nitrate is soluble in ethanol, however, silver bromide is not. And so in ethanol, the silver and the bromide come together and precipitate out of solution as a white precipitate. And so again, if you see a white precipitate occur very, very quickly, you know that the reaction rate is very, very fast. If you have a very slow formation of the white precipitate, the reaction is very slow. And if the, uh, you never see the appearance of the white precipitate, you know that there is no reaction. And so you monitor the time that it takes to see a precipitate to determine the order of, of reaction rates. And you're going to have several different substrates that you're going to be looking at, some with different leaving groups, 
Some are going to be primary alkyl halides, some of them are going to be secondary alkyl halides, etc. And you're going to be able then to look at the reaction rates and determine what favors an SN1 reaction by looking at the silver nitrate uh, reactions that we're doing. You'll be able to determine what uh, favors an SN2 reaction by looking at the Finkelstein reaction. And you'll be able to have a better understanding, we hope anyway, of what contributes to the SN1 reactivity and the SN2 reactivity.